The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 729 for Monday, October 1st, 2018. Greetings, <laughs> folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. The show where we take all of your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, the stuff that matters. We mix it all together. We curate it. We organize it. And then we come and deliver it. With the goal being that each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Otherworld Computing. We'll talk about their new Thunderbolt 3 10G Ethernet adapter shortly here, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Freeville, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. A beautiful fall day here in Durham. It's uh, it's awesome. I actually have an outdoor gig this afternoon. We're recording this on, on Sunday, which is, I believe, International Podcast Day or something like that. So, so there you go. But... Uh, but we are recording Sunday just due to some scheduling stuff. Um, but of course, releasing on Monday. But yes, it's a beautiful fall day. Oh, it's awesome. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, so, I'm going to go to our food truck festival, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I love these like outdoor fall things. It's good. Uh, you Let's do it. Let's get into some questions here. So David asks he says is there an ios terminal app for sshing into my max uh so that i can do this from bed and yeah absolutely man i use prompt from panic it, it's uh, now that i'm saying that uh it's the only one that i know of but i, I bet there's other ios terminal apps but uh prompt from panic is great you can set up your keys and all of that stuff. So you, you don't have to like type a password or even have a password involved in the exchange. SSH allows you to do key gen and stuff. And for those of you that are uh, wondering what we're talking about here, SSH is a way of connecting. It, it's a lot of things, but in, in this particular scenario, it's a way of connecting to the terminal on another computer. So being able to, you know, remote terminal into another Mac is super handy. Uh, I use it for a lot of different things, to be perfectly honest. But uh, one of the things I use it for is if my Mac is frozen and I don't want to or I want to avoid, you know, just powering it down, I can use an app like Prompt. And I if I can connect that way and I'll say more often than not, if the you know, if the mouse and keyboard on my Mac is frozen, often Terminal remotely will accept a connection, no problem. So I can SSH in and then I can issue one of my favorite commands, which I'll put in the show notes. But it is sudo, S-U-D-O, uh, shutdown dash R now. And what that does is it says sudo means do this as a super user and then shutdown. It's pretty obvious, except with the dash lowercase r uh, switch, it changes it from a shutdown to a restart. And then of course now means do it now. And I'll, you don't have to remember that, although it is a worthy thing to remember because, uh, but, but you can read it in the show notes. It's already there. So yeah, that's uh, so to prompt from panic software. Uh, they've been making Mac and iOS software for a very, very long time. The good folks over there. And I like panic and, and everything you can choose to sync your uh, settings across your iOS devices so that you have, you know, you set it up once and it just boom propagates everywhere. You've got it on your iPhone and your iPad and you know, you're good to go. So fun, right? Do you use prompt or any other terminal on the, uh, on iOS yet, John? I'm so looking on my phone here and I have something called Mocha VNC light. I haven't used it in quite a while, but that's so. for a remote graphical section Correct, session yes. not uh, not a remote terminal session yeah 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 so while we're on the subject of remote graphic sessions uh panic also oh no 
that's not Panics app. I, I relate them because they are next to each other on all of my devices, but it's not Panics app. I use an app called Screens from Adovia to do my uh, iOS remote access. And again, it's, you know, very robust and syncs and is pretty and all of that good stuff. But yeah. Mocha, it, and, and is that M-O-C-H-A-V-N-C light, John? Correct. Yes. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. It is. It's it's handy to be able to remote access in. I I think to your um, you know, from your from your iPhone to your Mac in various ways. Yeah, yeah. kind of a challenge since you don't get a lot of screen real estate. But right, right, <laughs> right. You need to connect and find out why your machine is unresponsive. Yes. Yes. Or yeah. The kick in the uh, kick in the processor. <laughs> yes. Well, sometimes it's really helpful. Yeah. Cool. All right, uh, moving on. Well, we'll stay on the iPhone for a minute. And uh, Joe, we will go to here. And Joe asks, uh, hi, Dave, and happy birthday. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for all the uh, all the birthday wishes after last week's show. Much appreciated. He says, I heard there is a way to put important medical info on your iPhone so that it is readily available. How is this done? And I will say back to you, Joe, happy birthday as well. Uh, on your iPhone, launch the health app and then in the lower right hand corner, tap the medical ID section in here. You can hit edit in the upper right and add all the information that you want. You can control, you know, what's available from the lock screen and all that stuff. And that's, that's actually what's handy here is, is you're setting up what someone could learn about you. Uh, if you were to be, you know, found unresponsive or whatever, you can put, do you have allergies? Who are your emergency contacts? And, and if you make an emergency call, I think, a, a note is also sent to those contacts as well. Now, um, at least with iOS 12, I'm, I can't remember if that was iOS 11 or not, but yeah. So handy stuff. I, uh, you know, obviously consider what you are putting in here and know that it, can be made accessible to people that can't unlock your iPhone. So think about that. But, um, but you know, it, I, I think it's a good thing. So have you filled yours out, John? I did once. Okay. And I think it'll ask for, uh, you know, what medication you're on. That yeah. may be uh, important if you're non-responsive. They may be like, oh, well, maybe he needs his medication mm. or she. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, I'll have to fill it out again. Yeah, Oh, did you fill it out, but on an older phone? Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it didn't, uh, I guess that doesn't migrate over. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I think you're right. I think that's not synced across iCloud. Did you set your, when you got your iPhone eight, did you set that up fresh or did you restore from an iCloud backup? I, re I restored. Interesting. And that didn't migrate over. Huh. I thought it didn't. <clears throat> well, I'll I, fill it out again. I'm pretty sure mine, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't re-enter mine. Um, this is the, now, I'm, now that I'm looking at this, the first place I've seen my, my new age listed, my new ripe young age of 47. Um, actually thought I was 45. So there you go. Thanks iPhone for reminding me of that. Um, I can never remember my age, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I didn't fill this out when I got, this phone but who knows i don't know man i'm getting old can't remember that's why we have these phones to to, to cyborg us and and make us better <laughs> at remembering these things uh speaking of max now helma writes in and says and this is just a good one from a, a troubleshooting you know a lot of times we well, actually we get a lot of questions that you folks don't hear about because so many of them don't hit what I call the 20% rule, right? I, I feel like what we should do on the show here is answer questions or discuss topics that appeal to the, the largest number of people. Now, obviously, we can't hit 100% because if you don't have an iPhone or, or you know, even if you don't have a Mac, right? Like we can't hit 100% with everybody. But I do like to hit the 20% rule. 
And this one, you, you know, as as with everything, the questions start with a very specific setup and device and all that stuff. But but from a troubleshooting standpoint, I think there's some some valuable stuff here. So she says she's got a Mac Mini. And she thinks it's one generation old. She says that has not much more to do than serve as a media server. She says her music and photos are on there. She says, I've made backups with Time Machine, but never checked the backups are actually okay. Uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, let's see, but uh, she says it runs. She it runs headless as an iTunes and and media server. It says over the last week or so, I would find that sometimes, maybe twice, I couldn't screen share into it. So running a headless Mac, she's using tools like we discussed, or you know, screen sharing from a Mac to connect. And she says I couldn't screen share, and also that SSH would not work. She said so. She rebooted the machine, and it worked. Monday, everything was fine. Tuesday, I was out the whole day. And when I got back, it wasn't playing music. So I rebooted it and nothing happened. It was late. So I left it. The next day, I tried again. Nothing. When I press the power button, the light comes on briefly for about a second and then goes out. No power chime. Nothing. I had a chat with Apple support and they referred me to find pages about how to reset the SMC and NVRAM or try the discussion forums. I've tried the SMC reset, but it doesn't help. NVRAM reset is not possible because it doesn't get to the point where it boots the command option PR, as we used to call it, the PRAM reset. She says, so that was a silly suggestion. Uh, she says, I, well, not necessarily. Trying that anyway might have worked, but but it, but it didn't. So there you go. She says, I've read all the posts, et cetera, short of taking it to the genius bar, which I can't anymore. She says, um, what could be wrong or differently put is the machine revivable? If not, I have to figure out if I can take the drive out uh, and which she has done since, uh, since this particular message. So, and she was able to get the data off of it, which is good. Um, so, you know, these things are, are like I said, from a troubleshooting standpoint, interesting. Of course, it's always fun. And I use that word diagnosing things based on an email and remotely and without having hands on and, and all of that stuff. But um, my remote diagnosis based on what we now know is that this is likely the power supply. Um, I've seen like things like this in my IMAX in the past and other people's IMAX for clients and, and things like that. And the symptom of that, you know, brief light and then nothing is consistent with what I've seen when the, when the power supply is uh, unable to do what it needs to do. But John, I think you have this same Mac mini model or something similar to it. And is there a battery inside that might be at issue or do you no. have any other thoughts? No. Okay. No, not this one. No, okay. I don't think... No, the, uh, some older Macs have a battery to retain uh, settings and that could be sure cause of grief. I, I seem to recall that there was some one series. So I have the 2014. The one before that was the 2012, which I had also. Did I or did I have the one before that? But I have the 2014. No, no, no battery. I seem to recall them having some sort of power supply recall Ooh. on the mini, or maybe it was the power adapter. I'm, I'm looking at their recall program here and I, I don't see it listed. So it may have expired. Sure. But yeah. Hardware it, problem. It was I'm the AC wall plug adapter. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe not. Uh, I mean, there was one on the wall plug adapter. I don't know. That was just, yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, I don't know, man. So yeah, it's probably the power supply. They are uh, internal to that as they are on most Macs. So replacing it, is you know a, a challenge but it's not a terrible challenge uh you know a company like other world computing or i fix it or whatever would have um you know guides to to walk you through that and the parts and all of that stuff so yeah yeah i found a thing that i fix it on okay. how to replace power supply and actually if uh and i remember when i upgraded mine you actually have to uh in order to uh, swap out the drive, which I did as soon as I got this thing, um, you do have to take the power supply out to yep. get at the insides. Oh, so, okay. So that's actually that that's actually a good sign because it means the power supply is one of the first things you encounter as you're peeling back the layers of the onion that is that Mac Mini, and that means less layers that you have to peel back to do the power supply. So that's not bad. Yeah, it's still a 
pain. They made it a pain to replace it, all that stuff. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, they just don't prioritize it being. I don't. I. I don't think they intentionally designed to make it a pain. I think they don't intentionally design to make it easy. They. They design for elegance and and heat distribution and functionality, and they could care less about repairability. So yeah. Yeah, you could give it a go. I mean, yeah. I see they have a guide here on how to do it with the 2012, and I think they'll even sell you the part as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, cool. Hey, uh, I do want to take a minute here and talk about our sponsor, which I just happened to mention, um, because they are a place that we go regularly for uh, all kinds of things that we need for our Macs, and that is Other World Computing at MacSales.com. These folks, like I said, you know, when I need RAM, when I need a hard drive enclosure, when I need uh, re really just about anything, like they've been doing this so long that they're trusted. They know what they're doing. They understand all of the stuff that they sell, which is really like I can't stress how important that is. Um, and as I mentioned in the intro to the show, they have their new Thunderbolt 3 10G Ethernet adapter. Right. So this is, I mean, it's pretty amazing, right? This allows anybody with a Thunderbolt 3 equipped Mac or PC, right, to download content 10 times faster than gigabit Ethernet. And it just plugs right into your Thunderbolt port. It's a nice little form factor. And this is the cool part about OWC is they're always kind of looking at what you need to either restore your Mac to previous functionality if you had a problem, but even more than that, how to expand your Mac beyond the walls that exist, you know, when uh, when you get it. So how to make it do even more for you. And if I it, and that really is sort of my synopsis of what OWC does is they provide the tools and the parts to and the knowledge to expand the functionality of your Mac and breathe extra life into it and all that. So check them out at uh, MacSales.com. Com, our sincere thanks to other world computing for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, uh, speaking of episodes, I will rewind us uh, a few episodes to number 726. We were talking about deleting or moving apps settings from one computer to another. And Allison over at no Silicast says uh, when you were guys were trying to help someone with the clean install process and looking for a method to save an app settings there is a great option app delete from reggieashworth.com will create an archive for you of any app support files this view and she sent a screenshot where you uh when you're deleting the app it comes up and it says there's an archive button and you can archive that and it will zip it up into a little file, allowing you to later retrieve them. And when you extract the file, it puts each bit into a folder that is named for where you need to put it back. So when you unzip this file, you get a thing that says like slash applications, which is where app delete would go or where whatever it is would go, you know, whatever she was deleting here. I think it was Telegram she was deleting. And then it shows, you know, in this private VAR folder was this and in home library preferences was that. So it tells you where to put everything, including the app itself. So this is super handy for uh, for migrating to another computer, I think. So very cool. Very, very cool. So we will put a link to that in the show notes for sure. I had no idea that app delete would do that, John. We talk about app delete fairly regularly here and and this is a first. So. Pretty good, right, huh? Nice. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Also in show 726, John, you mentioned that there was a way to see the entire history of everything you'd ever downloaded in Safari. And we talked about how that might be, for some, uh, a little concerning. Well, listener Mark shared an article with us that shows how to delete that list of downloaded files. It's over at osxdaily.com. And it's not, it, it requires launching the terminal and entering a few commands that uh, sort of purge out the contents of a SQL light database, database, which is uh, just a, a built-in database on Mac OS. And uh, 
and is used for lots of different things, including this. So yeah, get to go clean it all out. Just, just crazy that, um, I'm still blown away that that's there, but pretty good. So thank you, Mark. Very good stuff. Thoughts on that before we move on, John? No, you gotta, uh, sometimes you gotta uh, clean up your tracks. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I, I, I would be, I would assume, but it, everything's worth testing because we know what happens with assumptions. Uh, I would assume that if we were to go into private browsing mode and download something that it would not populate that database with whatever those downloads were. And that would be worth testing. But I, but I would be, in fact, I would be shocked if it, if it didn't do that. So, but, but again, you know, we've been shocked before it happens. So anyway, uh, moving on, we've got some Mojave stuff here, John. And Christopher says he upgraded his 2012 MacBook Pro to Mojave. Uh, that Mac has a fusion drive that he made himself with an OWC kit. He says the install was taking a long time. So he went to bed, woke up in the morning and the install had finished the fusion drive. Again, not one that came from Apple, but one that he made himself has been converted to APFS automatically as part of the Mojave update. He says, this is intriguing to me because I don't recall any mention that Mojave would support converting fusion drives to APFS. Yeah, it, it does. It, it would. And as you found, it does. He says, I know it was technically possible under 10.13, but that Apple didn't recommend it, nor would Apple let you boot from it without a lot of uh, uh, jiggering. He says, but I guess they are OK with it now. And I, yes, they are OK with it now. And I think that. um I, I, you know, uh, APFS, so APFS still isn't quite as fast as HFS plus if you're looking at raw speed, but it is the platform upon which Apple has chosen to build their future. And, and I think that's a good thing, right? I mean, it's still a very young, uh, file system, but obviously has proven to be really reliable for, uh, you know, for SSDs and, and will take advantage of some things that SSDs do. It's built for the way SSDs work. So with a fusion drive being the marriage of an SSD and a rotational drive, it makes sense to me that, that, you know, this would be supported. Obviously it's a little more complex than doing it on just a single uh, piece of physical media, but the whole concept of APFS creating a blob of storage and then letting you sort of, you know, use it and compartmentalize it the way you want. I don't want to say partition because that's not actually happening, but compartmentalization. Yeah. Like it makes sense that a fusion drive would, would probably be very well served to be under APFS. Now, whether straight rotational drives make sense as APFS or not, you know, I could make some arguments on either side. APFS wasn't, as far as I understand, it wasn't built at the core to be, uh, it was built at the core to take advantage of SSDs and the fact that there is no set physical location and no heads to move around. So I, I don't, I don't know that I see enough benefits to move rotational drives to APFS. Although the big one is again, that blob of storage that lets you recompartmentalize, but I can see that getting really messy with a rotational drive when there are like the concept of partitioning actually makes sense because you're keeping the drive heads in the same spot. So I don't know. What do you think, John? <sighs> My uh, carbon copy cloner destination drives are rotational and I did format them. as I know. APFS. And, and that's been okay mm -hmm. for you so far. Yeah. And I tried to boot from one the other day and booted fine. So, Booted fine into mm -hmm. Mojave or High Sierra? Uh, this was High Sierra. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, yeah. I say, you know, I, I remember we, we talked about this and, and that yeah. episode I actually linked to. They have a whole article about their support for APFS. So hmm. it says it'll work. Cool. And it does. Oh, that's good. That's good. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, you, you are, you are my, my closest test case for that. So, um, but yeah, I've been thinking about it. I, here's the thing. If you, if you take a rotational drive that you've partitioned and you migrate it to APFS, and then you take a very similar rotational drive 
and format it as APFS out of the gate. And then you go and look at the structure of how APFS has laid out, you know, all the core storage stuff there. It, at least based on my testing of, you know, six months ago or whatever, the two will be radically different from one another. The the upgrade concept, especially when there's multiple yeah. partitions, uh, it, it feels like, and this is, you know, again, it, less technical. This is just my gut. Feels like it's way less efficient in in the end than just formatting and starting from scratch with with APFS. But but maybe I'm seeing some nitpicks that don't really matter. I'll ask around. I I have some. We have some friends and contacts in the right places to to maybe get some some of those answers. So yeah. All right. Well, Chris also Christopher, sorry, also shared a very cool tip which is that disk utility in Mojave has a new command that to him and, and us looks like a real time saver. And that command is reset fusion with a capital F and it is for fusion drive machine, hardware configurations. This resets the disk devices in the machine to a factory like state, meaning one empty fusion volume. The command requires the machine to contain exactly one internal SSD and one internal rotational drive. If so, you are prompted. And if you confirm, both devices are repartitioned with GPT maps and a core storage fusion drive volume is created. No system software is installed and no user data is restored. All data on the machine is lost. So you'd have to do this from like recovery partition or, you know, some other way. You can't do it from the drive uh, from which you are booted. But that uh, that's handy to create a fusion drive because that used to be a real pain in the neck. So now disk util space reset fusion. And like in in theory, that would just do it and you're good to go. So that's How'd handy. Before? What's that, John? How did you have to, uh, what steps did you have to go through oh, before? It, it was a laundry list of steps to mm -hmm. you had to manually build the core storage uh, containers and, and put everything in them and all of that stuff. Yeah. It was not fun. It was not fun for, it, it, you know, especially for a scenario like Christopher, where he had to make his fusion drive himself. No, there was, there was a big long list of these, uh, of, of steps that you had to follow just right. Yeah. It was, oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's good. So that like that, that's awesome to see that not only did Apple do the, the upgrade or conversion, I should say, uh, of the fusion drive to APFS, but that they've got this tool like they're they're embracing this fusion drive thing. And th that's that's good. I, you know, uh, I know you could go back in the archives and find a bunch of Mac Geekab episodes where we were, you know, waving our arms in the air and shaking our fists and saying, do not trust fusion drives. This sounds awful. And it's still I still agree with the sentiment that it it sounds awful. The history since then and our experience and all of your experience since then says it's really not awful. It's it's pretty darn reliable. So still have a backup, but otherwise you're you know, carry forth. So uh yeah. So Jason uh in the tip realm here shared an article with us, which of course we will link to. And the name of the article, it's from twocanoes.com. And it is 12 customizations for Mojave's login window. So you can do things like switch between user and password mode. There are some secret commands where you can shut down or restart your Mac. If you type in uh, as the username uh, greater than power, lowercase, it shuts it down. Greater than restart, uh, restarts it. Uh, greater than shutdown, also shuts it down. Greater than sleep, uh, sleeps it. So there's some cool excuse me, cool things there. He says, that, and this is where it gets even more fun. You can enable a secret status menu item that shows computer info, uh, things like host name, system version. To enable it, run a command in the terminal. And they they list this command. It's a sudo defaults write command. And then, uh, and then once you've run that command, right from the login screen, just click on the lock in uh, the login screen there, and it will start displaying these. You can log in with a PIN instead of a passcode. You can uh, show the login window with full disk encryption. You can hide some buttons, and there are some commands for that. Uh, you can run a script at the login window. Mm. Uh, yep. 
You can have it show an on-screen keyboard, which is actually a handy thing um, if your keyboard dies, right? So anyway, there and all the how to like most of these require some terminal commands and stuff. So it's not worth going through it um, audibly here, but the link is handy, super handy and good to hear from you, Jason. Thank you for sharing this. Very cool stuff. Yeah, man. Fun, huh, John? Yeah, I'll have to try some of these. I don't know. You could type in commands. I I know. It's pretty good. Uh, I wonder how many of those are available. Like, are the commands new to Mojave or could we do that on High Sierra and we just, we weren't aware. So, yes, good. All right. Uh, And then moving on, we mentioned full disk access in the last uh, segment right there. And listener James will dig us in a little bit deep, deeper. So there is this thing. We talked about it briefly last week. In Mac Geek Up 728, where if you go to, oh man, uh, does he have it in here? Yeah, they, maybe they have it. Um, if you go into, it is in security and privacy, and then the privacy tab. I'm doing this from memory, but I think I got it right. Security and privacy in system preferences. So let's start at the beginning. System preferences, security and privacy, the privacy tab, then toward the bottom of the list on the left is a thing called full disk access. And this is where uh, you need to put apps that you want to be able to access all of the data on your Mac, including things like your photos library, your mail archives, your messages, Safari data, home folder, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? Otherwise, Mojave will prevent apps from accessing this data and as we and I I'm apologize for not going deeper into this last week because it's clearly become an issue. Uh, backup software really needs access here. And the problem is it can't it doesn't seem like it's possible for the software to just ask Mac OS to 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 grant to have you grant permission for it. Like you can with, you know, when it says, I want to use the microphone and you say, okay. And then boom, in that same spot, you've got, you know, your microphone, or I want access to your location or your contacts or your camera or whatever, like that Mac OS can like, there's a process that Mac OS can display a dialogue and say, Hey, this app is asking for this specific permission. Do you want to grant or deny with full disk access? That does not seem to be a thing. And apps like, Carbon Copy Cloner and Acronis Backup, which I just started using this week, and I have a lot of really good things to say about that. We'll talk more about it in a future episode, but they've been we've we've known about them for a long time, and I've I'd never dug in and uh, uh, until recently, and now I'm I'm sort of regretting not not having dug in sooner. But apps like Carbon Copy Cloner and Acronis and Backblaze need this access. Carbon Copy Cloner and Acronis had built this into their apps before Mojave was released. They took advantage of the developer beta period. They tested against their apps and realized they needed to do this. And it's a, it's sort of a, 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 a clunky thing. It, it, they can have it open that preference pane, but then you need to drag one of their icons into that preference pane. And, you know, they like, they've done it in clever ways so that it doesn't feel as kludgy as it actually is, but that's the way to do it. Backblaze seems to have been taken by surprise on this, folks, and that Mm. concerns me. Like, it it wouldn't have concerned me if we were at August 1st because we're in beta period. Like, that's the whole point of beta. But for them to, I mean, they're a, you know, a Mac-focused company, and for them to have, have missed this is a little shocking. I mean, they put up a knowledge base article that, that walks you through exactly what we were just talking to and we'll, we'll, or talking about, and we'll put that, we'll put a link there. But it just was, I don't know, just seems like I'm a little shocked that that they were caught with their with their pants down, as it were, on this. Um, But anyway, there you go. Yeah, I've had to do it for a couple of programs. So uh, Carbon Copy Cloner, the, their instruction, you actually have to drag a, a little blue fish. Yeah, which, uh, yeah, it's clever. It's a blue fish. Well, it's, a, it's basically a shortcut to one or more programs. And then the other one that I had asked me was... Uh, uh, drive genius and oh, actually when sense. you yeah. drive their icon over it the, the, both drive genius and drive pulse would like to have full disk access so i'm like okay yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that these apps would want slash need this. And it's and it also makes sense that Apple, you know, knowing who Apple is and or what kind of company Apple is, that they would build protections in so that this wasn't just available willy nilly anymore. But um, but yeah, 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 yeah. So there you go. It's good. Right. Fun stuff. Full disk access. And, and as anyone who has either installed Mojave Fresh or even those of us that have upgraded and it reset all of those permission grants for me, even the microphone and camera and, you know, contacts and all of that stuff. I am constantly being asked, hey, do you want to give this access? Hey, do you want to give this access? And I, you know, and I, I was talking with Adam Christensen over at MacCast about this the other day, and he brought up a good point that, you know, too much of this and users will get numb and blind to it and just start blindly hitting accept, accept, accept without reading um, you know, kind of like virus protection and malware protection on windows were 10 years ago. So it's, or maybe 15 years ago, but, um, but anyway, that, you know, it's, it's what, it's what Mojave does. So get used to it. But the good news is you only need to do it once for each app and then, you know, and then it remembers. So. Yeah. I'll tell you another thing Mojave does. Yeah. May break some of the stuff in your mail program. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to share my disappointment with Small Cubed. Yeah, I rely, uh, as you do, John. I rely on a couple of Small Cubed's plugins. Uh, they're, they're. I think their most popular one is a one called Mail Tags that uh, that I I've used, but I don't use. Um, but I do use Mail Act On, which we talk about on the show all the time because it lets you automate a lot of cool things about mail. And of course we use signature profiler or SIG pro and they are now baking all three of those and maybe even one more into something called mail suite. And that is the only product of theirs that will be Mojave compatible. And they are late with even a beta. And that's frustrating for us users who responsibly waited until release day uh, in part because we wanted to be able to use that software and now we can't and I, and really like I've screwed up a bunch of Mac geek Gab outbound emails this week because I, I just instinctively and inherently rely on things like both SIG pro and, and mail act on to, to, to do things to my outbound messages that, mm -hmm. uh, that are not being done right now. Well, yeah. I was replying to something and I'm yeah. like, wait a second, where, where, where's the signature? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> and, and, I my, look, and, and they were in the signature menu, but, one didn't get enabled automatically because that's what SIGPRO does. So right. I had to, you know, like a caveman had to manually yeah. activate the signature. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and the, um, it, you know, like I, I like to, when, when we, when we reply to your emails, I always like to CC our Mac geek Gab address. We send it from that address, but I, I also always also like to CC it because that way John sees it and you do the same thing and I see it. And, uh, and I don't like to have to do that manually. And I don't like to have to go into mails, compose thing and turn the automatically CC myself option on and off because then I forget. And, and so now I use mail act on and it automatically knows because I told it, I created a, an outbox rule that says, if it comes from this address, add this address, which is the same address as a CC. And then I don't have to think about it. And I like mail act on's delay in sending so that if I hit send on a message and then say, ah, either I missed something or, ooh, maybe I didn't want to say that. And I have another outbox rule that looks for the word attach in any of my email, it, you know, any of the text. And if it has that word, but there is no attachment, it I have it pop up a little dialogue that says, hey, Dave, you sure you want to send this message or did you forget to add the attachment? It's like, oh, right. Good catch. So I don't have any of that. And they said they would have a beta out uh, on the 24th with Mojave. But as of, as we said, we're recording this on Sunday, the 30th, as of today, as of right now, no go, which is sad. Mm -hmm. It's a sadness. So I'm a little disappointed as, as I believe you are too, my friend. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Uh, what does not disappoint me is all of you. In fact, all of you make my week fantastic every week. And 
I specifically want to call out thanks individually to our premium subscribers whose contributions came in over the last uh, week and a half or so. Actually, we didn't do this segment last week. So, uh, and again, our, our premium program at macgeekup.com slash premium. If you want to support us directly and you certainly don't have to, um, it is an optional thing. We are still happy to answer your questions, although premium users do get priority in the queue. They get answered first. That's our, one of our ways of saying thanks. Uh, so you can learn all about it there, but if you don't want to or can't, that's totally okay. Please still listen. Please still send in questions, all of that stuff. That said, thanks to uh, the following who are on our every six month $25 plan, which is thank you to Craig R., William P., Andrew B., David H., Fernando F., Gary R., Jeffrey F., Lyndon N., Michael E., Andrew S., Royce T., Bryn T., James H., Daniel H., Martin S. Well, actually, I'll come back to Martin S. Roger Y., Robbie R., Sharon F., Randy B., and Michael or Michelle D. Uh, all at 25 every six months. And then at 50 every six months is Martin S. and Lee F. So thank you to all of you. And then on the monthly $10 plan... We have Ken L, Clive S, Dave G, who's also in the chat room. Hey, Dave. Gary B, Jeff F, Joseph B, P, Tony Z, Everett T, Nick S, and Robert D. And then a one-time $25 contribution from Leslie B. Thank you so much to all of you. You rock. All right. Uh, let's stick with uh, new stuff here, John and questions. And let's go to listener Paul who asks, um, I hear podcasts of people loving the new shortcuts, AKA workflow app on iOS 12, but I'm struggling as a lot of the things I do are less than three or five taps, like tweeting photos or finding friends on find my friends. Things I feel take a lot of time and would be great as a shortcut, and from what I can tell are not an option, are things like choosing which AirPlay speakers to connect with, uh, defaulting for AirPlay 2 to connect to multiple speakers or to create a group in some way, telling my iPhone to have the Apple TV use the AirPlay speakers. I don't have a HomePod to tell. He says, I would love to say something like, you know, good morning, Siri, and have it connect to speakers, start the news podcast, turn on lights and start the coffee. Um, he says, hopefully the workflow slash shortcuts team keeps fleshing this out. And yeah, I agree with you, right? You know, workflow, AKA now shortcuts built into iOS 12, uh, is a good start. And the fact that it's now under the Apple umbrella is a good thing. I think, um, you're, you know, like your good morning Siri thing. Isn't that far away from being a reality, right? Because that is essentially what you're describing as a home kit scene. And now you're asking for that scene to trigger a shortcut to do some actions. And of course it's some actions that it cannot yet do, but like I can foresee a future. It might be a year from now where that's a, that's a realistic possibility. What you just described, um, especially now that shortcuts is, you know, part of iOS. And again, under the Apple umbrella, there are a couple of things that, uh, are sort of sad things that we've lost along the way, collateral damage. Like there's no more Slack plugin for workflow where they're used or for shortcuts where there used to be for workflow. So I can't like have it post to a specific Slack group or whatever. And, and there's some other things like that where it's like, Ooh, okay. I wonder if that's coming back or if that's just dead. But, um, but yeah, I think what you're describing is doable. I, I wish I, my big wish list or the thing at the top of my wish list is that I could control the uh, suggestions, right? You know, when I, when it says, oh, hey, do you want to call, you know, your wife back or whatever? And it's like that serious suggestion thing. I, it, it's, it's doing things. Like I mentioned last week, our, our Mac geek about, oh, I did, maybe I didn't mention this last week. Well, good news. Uh, I mentioned it on TDO, our, our daily observation show. Our Mac Geek Up app now has been updated with iOS 12 support, including support for not only Siri actions, but Siri suggestions. We publish to Siri, not to anywhere else. It stays on your phone. Uh, we publish to Siri 
when you've la- when you listen to an episode, right? And especially when you listen to the latest episode, and then if Siri realizes that you listen to, you know, MGG's latest episode uh, at lunchtime on Thursday, it might, in its infinite wisdom, choose to offer you that as a suggestion that you can then take advantage of. I would love to help Siri be more wise and more infinite in its wisdom. And I would love to get control over that and say, hey, on Thursday at lunch, can you remind me to play Mac Geek Gab? That would be awesome, please. Thank you. So, um, but, you know, we're like, we're just at the beginning of this. And we know Apple moves slowly with these things so that the features actually work and all of that. So I think so. What do you think, John? I haven't made a shortcut in a while. Okay. I think I have to make one. Okay. I don't use Siri that much, though. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I I mean, understandably, I don't either. Uh, I use shortcuts in different ways. You can't trigger shortcuts from your watch anymore, which is sort of weird. That's one of the collateral damage things, which I feel like should come back. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think they're expecting you to trigger them from Siri, which is uh, one way, but it is an audible way. And sometimes you want a quiet way. So, yeah, but I like I think they see the value in automation over there at uh, at the fruit company. So <laughs> I, I think, I think so. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. What do you think, man? I think we're moving on. We're moving on. Move, move, moving on. All right. Uh, let's go to, let's go to Jeff. Jeff asks, he says, Due to a lovely cloudy weekend here in New England uh, recently, I decided I would spend the day playing photo cleanup and backup. I have a two part question. Realizing High Sierra on the new 5K iMac using photos for OS 10, he says, uh, or Mac OS, I guess. I realized I have two photo libraries that I want to merge into one. All online directions say to import and merge libraries into Aperture 3.6 and then convert back to photos. Aperture doesn't show my original library in the selection list. And when I search for it in the finder, it's grayed out. The library has been converted to work with photos and is no longer an iPhoto library. Uh, And then part two of his question is relating to backups and uh, fault tolerance. He says, I decided that my seven-year-old hard drive isn't necessarily the best spot for both old and new photos libraries. Can I store them on my Synology NAS, my Synology disk station? Photos is saying no because it's a NAS drive. Should I buy a reliable external? Seems like a waste not to be able to use the NAS. So as always, we will answer these questions in reverse. Yet do not use the NAS for storing your photos library. I have tried this and it is terrible. There's a reason that photos tells you not to do it. Um, It was possible, but not great with iPhoto uh, in that I only had to deal with library corruption, say three or four times a year. Whereas with photos, uh, it was almost constant uh, dealing with it. And I think it's that, you know, photos takes advantage of things like hard links and things like that, which are inside of both HFS plus and APFS. And, uh, and so I think that's the, uh, I, 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 you, yes, an external hard drive is the right answer there for your photos library. Now, yeah, actually, before we move on uh, to, to the next huh, question. I never even tried it. So, so it'll actually yell at you if you try to create yeah. a library on a. On a network wow. volume. Yeah. Huh. It says mm-hmm. don't do that. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. It, it, and it is, it is right with that advice. It is, that is good advice right there. <laughs> So now how about just backing it up? What if you just want to copy the whole thing? Is it, is it okay to store that on an as? Absolutely. I do that. I use carbon copy cloner to back up my photos library to, uh, to my NAS okay. for sure. Yeah. But just don't, don't manipulate it. Over. Yes. Don't. Yes. Right. 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 Yep. Huh. yep. I wonder why that is. I, again, I think it's, it's exactly like what said, I said. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it just, yeah, they do things that they, they want to know what the file structure is. And it's, and again, iPhoto libraries were the same way, but you could get away with it. Now, I guess they're just doing more or something where that bad, no bueno. 
All right. Uh, but to answer the first part of the question, uh, the, the, the advice of going to Aperture and back to photos, bad, 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 bad advice. Um I would absolutely use Power Photos from Fat Cat Software. They are no, they are not currently a sponsor of the show. They haven't been in a, in a little while. They you know do ad campaigns according to their schedule. Because guess what? It's their business. Um, but I I mention that only because the lingering benefit for all of you from their ad campaign with us here at MGG is that there was a coupon code that is, uh, at least as of the other day, still active that might save you 20%. So uh, I share that. Uh, but Power Photos, regardless of their sponsorship status, as you can tell, is absolutely the tool that I not only recommend, but that I use happily for myself and any clients like what you are asking about here, Jeff, is the most common thing that I am asked about by, you know, my local like Dave the Nerd clients that that ask me to help them with stuff. It's it's we've been we've got a million photo libraries from over the years and we want to consolidate them so that we can take advantage of iCloud photo library and all of that stuff and it's like yeah now is the right time to do that and power photos makes this super easy and reliable so that's the answer it's really simple um just use power photos, merge them together. It'll convert iPhoto libraries to photos. If you still have old ones of those around and it works really well. So that's, that's my answer there. Do you have, do you have any, uh, anything to add or share? I think that's the best answer. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Cool. Uh, all right. We talked a little bit about Mojave now, and we talked about some of the positive stuff and just some tips now we've heard some Mojave upgrade woes to John and, uh, and we will go to listener David who said, and, and I've, and this is consistent with what I've heard from other folks who are having problems. Not every, obviously not everybody's having problems, but for those that are, I hear this, he says, trying to go from high Sierra to Mojave on a non retina, but supported 27 inch iMac. I'm getting Repeated random re-logins and rebooting. Uh, he says at 4 a.m. Finally, I decided to nuke and pave and I restored back to a high Sierra backup. And I'm going to try again. And he said it did not work. So, yeah, uh, there there are some setups where the current Mojave installer does not get it right. And and, you know, let's be fair this is not a huge surprise, right? That there would be some significant number of untested scenarios where something's just not right. And we've seen Apple fix this stuff in the past where, you know, the installer for whatever, you know, Mojave 10. Dot, what is it? 14 now, right? 10.14.1 is more reliable than, you know, 10.14.0 and fixes some of these things. And so my advice would be either sit tight or uh, with, sit tight with high Sierra and wait uh, for a new installer or install Mojave as your fresh install and then let its migration assistant slurp in things from your high Sierra backup. Thoughts on that, John? Yeah, I've, I'm, I'm thinking back. I Yeah. You had problems like this with a previous OS somewhere. Well, you know, and one, it was funny is that I ran the installer. It got to a certain point. The progress bar just stopped. Yeah. And like everything stopped. And I'm like, uh. and what fixed it was shutting it down and running it again. <laughs> then it, it finished. Um, the other thing is check the, um, you may want to use this utility and check the uh, structure of the volume that you're trying to install on because it may be running into some inconsistencies and that's why it's not working. I've had that happen hmm. either just utility or something else. And uh, it one time. Yeah. I, I do that now before I do an OS upgrade as I, yeah. I run this utility just for good measure. Every now and then it'll find something that's like, Oh, you know, the number of index blocks is kind of off and stuff. Yeah. And, that could be why that's happening as well. I, well, I, and I'm I, you're you're totally right. I think in in David's case, given that he nuked and paved, that's probably not it. But 
Oh, right, right. Right. But we don't know exactly what nuke and pave meant in that scenario. So it's possible. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. Uh, moving on to more generic questions, although nothing's generic here at Mac Geek Gab. Jeffrey writes, he says, I have uh, a 2011 MacBook Air, similar vintage as you, Dave. Uh, running high Sierra for some time. I have not been able to reliably use USB memory sticks. I can see them in system profiler, but nothing shows up in disk utility. Uh, in my searches through the internet, it appears the USB kernel is not working, but no fix is offered any suggestions. So yeah, this is, this is interesting, right? So my first thought is go into uh, safe mode and then also try this in recovery mode. And and the two are different, right? Because recovery mode is essentially a completely separate, albeit limited, build of Mac OS. It is not the same as the one that you're booting from. I mean, it could be the same version, but it's not the same f files, right? It's a separate partition or a separate container, going back to our earlier discussion. And uh and 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 so it it would it's a good way to test things like this that it, that would be reasonable to test. You can't test everything in recovery mode, but you can test this. So that would be one safe mode is your boot volume, but you're telling it to skip a bunch of, uh, you know, non-critical extensions, third party stuff and things like that. So, uh, if it works in recovery mode, but not safe mode, then that does indeed indicate an issue with that USB kernel slash driver. But if it works in both recovery mode and, sa and safe mode, then it's some third party extension. But if it works in neither of those, then maybe it's a hardware or a reset SMC problem. And we heard back and it worked in recovery mode, but not safe mode. So now we know, right? Okay. So it is a, an issue with that particular build of Mac OS. The computer's fine. Good. No problem there. So it's either, right? So now that we know we got to fix some low level driver in Mac OS. <clears throat> uh, if you know exactly what files to replace, then great. I don't, uh, that's not necessarily impossible to find, but also not necessarily the easiest thing. My what I would try with if you don't want to nuke and pave is to reinstall High Sierra on top of itself and then do the combo updater on top of it. In theory, that will replace the USB kernel slash driver in High Sierra. And I think that would fix this. What do you think, John? Uh, wouldn't just doing a reinstall from a recovery be enough? That's what I'm saying. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then you said, but also run the combo. I guess that's true, right? Because a reinstall from recovery would pull down the, that's that an internet yeah. reinstall. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair. Right. So I don't think, I don't think you need to do it twice. I agree with that. Yep. Yep. And it's also it possible weird, that the combo updater could do it, right? If, if the USB driver has changed since, you know, high Sierra dot 10.13.0, then uh, then it would be in the in the combo updater and you'd be good to go. If it has not changed since 10.13.0, then you need to do, like you said, John, the, you know, just the recovery mode thing. But yeah, you're right. You don't need to do both. Good call. I mean, for fun, if you want to see what's happening underneath the hood, which some of us like, I mean, you could look in the system information, uh, software extensions. And if you do that, you wait a while, like I'm waiting right now, and a little wheel spins, and then it'll show you all of the uh, kernel extensions that are either loaded or not loaded, and some of them will have the word USB in them. Yeah. Uh. Just out of curiosity, you may want to look through that list and you know see if uh, see if anything that has the word USB in it is is loaded because it'll show you. You know, it shows you the version, modified, loaded, obtained from. That's another, actually, that's another interesting thing is that it'll show you if the extension is from Apple or from someone else. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, diagnosing that could, could, <laughs> could be a chore. But if you're curious to see all of these uh, kernel extensions, uh, some of which will talk to your USB stuff, uh, that's a place to look. 
I like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. most Look likely be IOUSP HID driver hosted. Yeah, there's a, there's a boatload of them, but not all are loaded because it doesn't need all of them. Yeah, I would look at Apple. The USB mass storage driver is the one to look at. And and I will tell you now, you know, going from generic to very specific on the latest build of High Sierra, the IO USB mass storage driver is version 140.70.2. And that is loaded, even though I don't have any USB devices, USB storage devices attached. There is also something called IO USB mass storage class, and that is version 4.0.4. And that is not loaded. Um, and uh, be- probably because I don't have any uh, USB drives attached. But on both of those, I will say they were last modified on May 8th, 2018. So it's possible the combo updater would solve this problem. Possible. But to be safe, just do the the you know maintenance reinstall just reinstall over the top mm-hmm. yeah all right fun see this is why i like this stuff man it's uh you know we have fun with it it's good um okay i don't know where we're gonna go with this next one but we're gonna go there because why not jason uh brings us a fun little issue He says, I have hurt my iTunes library. You know, the one thing on my computer that I've been lovingly growing and tending to since 2001. And I was very nervous about turning on iCloud Music Library until last year for fear of hurting my library. A few weeks ago, I noticed that there were doubles of several songs in my library. Somehow, Apple Music had decided to add them to my library, but they weren't downloaded. Perhaps because they were in some of my playlists? I don't know. So I deleted the extra copies that weren't on my local drives and then happened to look under file library show duplicates. I found thousands of duplicates. Some songs had the iCloud status of matches, some Apple Music and others uploaded. And that's a handy tip right there. Turning on that iCloud status column in iTunes is really handy for uh, for this, and you can do that by going to oh, view. In this is in iTunes, view show view options, and I believe is it there. Oh man, uh, I believe it's there. Maybe not. Yeah, iCloud downloaded, uh, and it will show you. Well, that just shows you if it's downloaded. Oh yeah, then there's iCloud status. Sorry. Yeah, so it's view. Show view options, and then uh, and then right at the top in the in the music list there is both iCloud downloaded and iCloud status. Really handy to see what has happened with those things. So uh, moving on, he says I figured I could just erase the Apple Music ones. Uh, I have added very few albums to my library with Apple Music. I'm still a dinosaur that prefers to own my music. He says, so I delete all those songs. And then to my horror, I realized a few days later that basically 90% of the songs in my hundred or so playlists have disappeared. I found 5,000 music files in my trash. I added them back to iTunes, but the playlist had lost the links to their songs. The playlists were empty. He says, but we have backups, right? So I grabbed an older version of my iTunes library.itl file from Time Machine and popped it into my iTunes folder. When I rebooted iTunes, everything was fine. Success? No. Within moments, iTunes realized it was out of sync with its cloud and promptly deleted all of my playlist contents. I couldn't seem to find a way to tell iCloud Music Library that I wanted to reset it and to create a new master to populate the cloud. I deleted everything from the cloud from my laptop, but that made iTunes want to delete all my playlists every time. So he says, uh, however, now uh, he says, I, uh, with some digging, I learned that you can import all of your playlists at once by importing the iTunes library.xml file. So I did that and got my playlists back. However, he says, now I'm seeing four copies of every playlist and worse. It seems like any song that was used in any playlist is now missing from my library, even though the audio files themselves haven't moved anywhere. So, um, yeah, bad. Uh, really, what it sounds like is you need to reset your iCloud music library on the cloud. 
Uh, that's way easier said than done, and it would involve Apple support and you turning off iCloud Music Library on all of your iOS devices and all of that. But that honestly might still be worth it, um, especially since you have that older backup. You could just you know get them to reset it, turn it off everywhere first, get them to reset it, put everything back, and and see what happens. Right? That that might be the best thing, uh, because otherwise you are thrice deleting quadruplicate playlists and then rematching songs and the rematching of missing songs is actually or the refinding of missing songs in iTunes is not actually as bad as it sounds. Uh, when iTunes says, you know, I don't know where this song is. Can you show me when you do that with the first one? So you dig into where your music library is now and you say, yep, yep. Okay. Here, that's where this particular song is iTunes then learns from that and says, okay, if this song is in this location on that drive, then I can look back and see what's the same about all the other songs that are missing. And it often can just match those without you having to do any manual work. It's smart enough to, to do that. So, um, so you have a couple of choices, uh, depending on where you are at this point in time, I think I would, I would still go for the you know, call Apple support and see if they can push this change for you because hopefully that would do it, but you never know. What do you think, man? My, my friend, Mr. John F. Braun. I think Apple's music products are very confused. <laughs> that is a fair statement. Certainly iTunes and iCloud music library can be very confused. I, I, I am, I am just like Jason, right? I have a, very carefully crafted intended i iTunes library and when i turned on an iCloud music library i mean i made all kinds of backups obviously as jason did and i never had any of the problems that anyone went through but that i am aware of all the problems that people like jason went through and 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 many others before you and and we do know that apple has the ability to to participate in solving this and and at least in the past has been interested in doing so so i i would call them See what, see what they say. Yeah. The way I solve the problem is I don't use any of their cloud-based music services. So there. Well, that's one way. I mean, you miss like out on listener. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Like our listener, all of my music is, is local. None you miss out on a lot though. Without, oh, yeah. without I mean, mm -hmm. you know, like finding new music and stuff like it, I, it's, I really, mm -hmm. my library now is most definitely a mix of Apple music stuff and, you know, stuff that I owned and, and uploaded. And, and I really, you know, I mean, there's times when that's frustrating. Like when I want to grab an MP3 of a thing to, you know, a song to chop it up. And I realize, Oh, I actually don't own that song. That's just an Apple music thing. I can't go chop that up, that kind of thing. But otherwise it, it you know, the flexibility of streaming music, it, it is the right, it is the way of the, uh, I was going to say of the future. It is the way of the present. Um, you know, owning your music is most definitely a way of the past, especially for those of us that are playing music from our electronic oh, devices. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'll admit it. Yeah. yeah right. I'm stuck Same. In the past. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was there for a while too. I, you know, I, I resisted this and then, and then, and then suddenly realized, oh, I, I sort of opened the floodgates and okay, it's fine. Like it's better this way. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back. So, yeah. 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 And also one word of wisdom, well, number of words of wisdom here from uh, Michael in our chat room. Where's mm. our chat room? If you ever want to chat and listen, you would go to MacGeekGab.com slash stream. And what Michael had to say is iTunes is a bag of hurt and needs to be fixed. And, and I concur. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, it is. Um, it, it It is. Right. I, I don't know. I think Apple knows this, too. But I, yeah, I don't know what the I think I think the magic answer is, you know, splitting it up into separate apps and and getting the whole syncing thing out of my music app and all of that. And, who you know, actually, wait a minute. Marzipan is the answer there. Right. Because with Mojave now, it's much easier to take an iOS code base and port it over to the Mac. Right. And we've seen that with news and home and, and stocks and what's I can't I can never remember the fourth one. But but those are all iOS apps that have been recompiled and, and built to work on the Mac. And this is why Mojave won't run on older Macs, 
because it needs metal, the graphics or the GPU framework, I should say, because iOS assumes metal is is there. And in order to do this whole Marzipan thing, Marzipan being the tech that allows this recompiling of, of iOS, apps, uh, iOS apps for the Mac, uh, you need metal. So, but iOS has a music app. They have a, you know, video app, right? So those could presumably be easily ported over. Uh, I, I don't want that UI for my browsing my music on the Mac, but like maybe this paves the way for an easier transition for Apple to solve the iTunes problem. I hadn't really even thought about that. You know, so is, is Mojave the answer to the iTunes problem? Uh, could be right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. It's worth, uh, it's worth pondering. Todd has a question worth pondering, my friend. He says, I am annoyed that my Mac will wake up its screen for notifications when my Mac is asleep. He says, I did some research and went into system preferences notifications and found that there is a setting called in the do not disturb section for when the display is sleeping. And uh, he says, I thought this was where he said. And so he checked it. And there you go. Uh, he says, I thought this was working, but I saw a glow from my office and saw the screen with some notifications on it. He says, how can I get my Mac screen not to wake up for any reason when it is asleep? Um, yeah. And he's running high Sierra. So the, that's a really good question, man. I, my guess is that by turning on that, uh, setting in system preferences, notifications for, uh, do not disturb when the display is sleeping. My guess is that that is being honored by the OS uh, and that your Mac is waking up for another reason. Uh, and there are lots of things I've got backup software that will wake up my screen. I've like, there's all kinds of things. So I, I don't know what the magic answer is, but I don't know that there is one, but digging in and uh, thinking about those things that are running overnight or scheduled to run. You could look at uh, a piece of software that I like to use is called Lingon. And that really allows you to manage all your launch launch services uh, uh, items, but you also get to see what those items are configured to do on your system. And it, you might see, Oh, look, you know, at 6 30 PM every day, carbon copy cloner is set to launch and back up. It's like, right. Yeah. I, because I told it to do that. And, and, but you can see all of that in one place and that's actually really handy. So what do you think, John? Um, I think I'll have to, uh, dig into the past and find this. Um, remember that log command that I came up with that one time. So there's an event. If you want to know why the heck your machine is waking up, uh, -huh. You can run this command from the terminal that basically rips through your uh, system log and looks for any sleep wake event. Right. Sometimes the codes are kind of cryptic. Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, update that. I don't want to read it out to you here. Okay. No copy and, well, wait, no, I can copy and paste it. I think. Oh, you got it. Okay, cool. I, I would I would actually love to have you write that up as an article for us at TMO because that would be a great resource just to have it so that we can we can point to that. Oh, yeah. All right. Let me. Uh, I'll put a note in the show notes so you'll see it when you're when you're processing through the show notes. So there you go. Uh huh. Cool. Yeah. Cool, again, cool. sometimes the codes it gives don't make any sense, but sometimes it does. Like for example, one that I saw one time. Um, with one of my machines, it was like, oh, HID. I'm like, huh? What's that? Oh, human interface device. I think yes. what happens sometimes is if you, uh, uh, some mice maybe, or, or input devices may be very sensitive and, and just like walking near the computer and, and jostling it yep. causes it, causes the computer to think, hey, there's somebody here. I better break, better wake up. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Yeah, right. That can happen for sure. 
I have, you know, I still have the dead hard drive in this iMac here in the studio because it was the pre-Fusion Drive iMac that had the parts of a Fusion Drive. It's got a 256 gig SSD and then a, a dead one terabyte hard drive. And uh, as I said, I think over Thanksgiving, Sky and I'll take this thing apart and rip that drive out. But uh, when it tries to, when the machine wakes up now, it, the drive makes a lot of noise because it tries to spin and can't and it sounds sick because it is. And uh, when I have band practice in this room, often there's enough motion or enough low end, you know, that sort of jostles the mouse on the table here. And that causes the machine to try and wake up. And occasionally you'll hear it, you know, doing going through its try to wake up the drive sounds. And everybody's like, what is that? It sounds awful. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, it's dead hard drive. It's fine. So now I run caffeinate during band rehearsal and the, the machine stays awake and doesn't try to wake up that or doesn't try to mount that drive. So, yes. All right. Uh, let's see, my friend, what else do we, what have we here? Two cool stuffs found John. The first is actually from listener, John. And in fact, I think both are from listeners, John, and I'm not sure. Is it the same, John? Nope. Two different listeners, John. Uh, the first will be uh, the Skywin wireless charging receiver for AirPods. Listener John says, I made a wireless charging kludge for my AirPods uh, and it worked out, but it was butt ugly. And I paid about $15 in Chinese parts. A couple of weeks ago, I ran across this, the Skywin wireless charging receiver for AirPods. It is an AirPod compatible Qi charging lightning adapter sleeve that goes over the AirPods, uh, over the AirPods case, plugs into the lightning port, allows Qi to charge it. And he says it looks great and functions just as well. It's only 20 bucks on Amazon. And he says it would make a great Christmas present uh, if Apple doesn't get their case out first. So thanks for that, man. Yeah. Good stuff. We'll put that in the in the show notes with cool stuff found. I like it. Are you an AirPods guy yet, John? Mm, no. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then uh, I highly recommend them. And I, it's crazy. I, uh, everything says I should hate these things, but they're super convenient. And it's the best headset I've ever used for my iPhone, bar none. Like wired, wireless, doesn't matter. Far and away, the best headset I've ever used for. Uh, for any phone, really, not just my iPhone, but any phone. So, and it's really nice not to have to, I used to use a wired headset because that's where I could get the best sound quality, but it sucks having to carry the phone around with you when you're talking. And so now I just leave the phone on my desk and I can walk around and I'm good to, good to go. Uh, and they work for music too, as you might guess. Second cool stuff found from second listener, John, is uh, <clears throat> the... Verizon Fios's network extender. So uh, what he says is I moved into a new house and we have Verizon Fios service. He says, but their modem router Wi-Fi combo didn't make it to the other side of the house. He says, no topic, of course, has been covered more thoroughly in, on Mac Geek App than Wi-Fi extension, mesh routers and Wi-Fi solutions. So I started looking into solutions you've recommended. But while doing that, I got an email from Verizon about their Wi-Fi extender, which we'll put in the show notes. He says uh, it uses coax to, and he goes and explains how it, it uses the coax cables in your house as it's ethernet backhaul, right? So you don't need wires in your wall, or you don't need to put new wires in your walls because it takes advantage of the existing coaxial wires that are in your walls to send the network signal across and instead of it being a, uh, you know, just a Wi-Fi repeater, this now becomes a Wi-Fi broadcaster device that you can put in another part of your house. And it made me realize that we've described this many times, but never quite that way, because the technology that he's talking about is called Mocha, M-O-C-A. And Mocha is the thing that allows you and Verizon and Comcast and many others and action tech really is the company building a lot of these Mocha uh, adapters. It allows you to use some of the channels on your coax signal or coax lines to send data across. And it doesn't get in the way of you watching TV across those or sending other data across them because it's just using channels and there's tons and tons of bandwidth available 
on coaxial cables. So yeah, it made me realize we kind of needed to come at this mocha thing from a different way because this, this does work. And if you can take advantage of it, it can be a great way. Even if you have a mesh system like me, you know, I've got mesh system, mesh, mesh system du jour in the house, right. At any given point in time, as I'm testing something, but I do have coax cable going from one side of my house to the other because it was built that way, or at least retrofitted that way for television. And that way I can do wireless backhaul or wired, sorry, wired backhaul without having to run ethernet cables. And it makes my wireless network work really well. So I highly recommend if you have coax in your walls, taking advantage of this and letting your mesh or your repeaters use that. So. Yes, John. Yes. Yes. Thoughts about I'm following. This? Okay. I'm with you. I, I thought you were. I, I, I thought you were preparing to say something. So I was. I was. You know. Well, I. I, I am. But well, go I need you to finish first. I am finished, my friend. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I thought. Uh, well, we talked about this earlier, but I, I thought I'd mention this now since we're talking about cool stuff. Alan Davis. I learned something new about power. Okay. You may ask, what did I learn? Well. I learned it. So I got, um, so you and I were just at a show and, uh, I got a goodie and I was like, Oh, what do I do with it? What was the goodie, um, John? The goodie is the Ventev Wallport PD 1300 wall charger. It's a USB C charger. Okay. All right. And, and then P I had to PD stands for power delivery. I'm going to, I'm going to point that out. Cause that's a, that's a term. Now, if you haven't heard it, it means high uh, high power, del del high power being high, high charge voltages being sent across, um, uh, or amperages, I should say. Right. Yes. High right. charge and amperages it, being sent across whatever cable, USB C cable. Yeah. Right. And then, um, and there's something called, uh, there's a, a technology here called fast charging that you can do with certain devices, Dave. And guess what? I have one of them. Okay. The iPhone 8 and later supports fast charging. And Apple even has a little article titled Fast Charge Your iPhone that explains this to you. And it explains what you just explained. It's like, so fast charging, their definition, and I verified this last night, um, is that it'll charge your device up to 50% in 30 minutes. And I verified it and it did. I, I ran it down all the way. And actually, I think it was at 52% after 30 minutes. Wow. It's like, so that's cool. But they say here is that this only works with Apple's USB-C adapters or one that supports what you just said, which is USB power delivery. I also had to buy cable. Um, and looking around, it's interesting online. So, so I, I went to the local store here and they, they had the Apple um, USB-C lightning cable. So I got that. It's funny because I was looking online, you know, to figure, you know, maybe I was going to order one from Amazon. Apparently, there are some cables that claim to not work with fast charging, which is weird. But I found at least one that explicitly said, OK, even though I got USB-C on one side and um, lightning on the other, I don't do fast charging. And it's like, but why would you even want to limit your product like that? I don't know if they're using cheap wires or, or what. So be How careful. if you. Yeah. All I know is I just found one that explicitly said we don't do fast charging. We'll we'll do you know charging charging sure, but, but not this. Uh, but we don't support this. Uh, I guess the, the U.S. power delivery. So, so yeah, it, this doesn't make sense because I'm well. I'm I mean I'm reading a a thing about power delivery right now from a company that sells power delivery products. So bear that in mind. You, you know. Uh, but it, the, what they say, and they describe it well, is that power delivery is a spec for handling higher power and allows a range of devices to charge quickly over a USB connection. It op And it's why the MacBook and MacBook Pro can charge over USB now, right? That, that USB-C allows this. It says it operates by facilitating a conversation between two devices to negotiate a power contract so they can determine how much power can be pulled from the charger. Power delivery starts at the five volt setting and is configurable up to 20 volts. So it is uh, variable voltage using a standard USB-C cable. It can handle up to 60 watts and will go up to 100 watts using a designated EMCA cable. I'm not sure what EMCA is. And I'm not going to look it up during the show, uh, but that's so that's interesting. So maybe 
The cable you're talking about, John, is a charge only cable and doesn't allow data to pass across it. Maybe. Right. Could and be. and without data, they can't do this negotiation to say, hey, I can take more than you're giving me. Lay it on me, brother. Right. Like maybe it's not doing that. So that could be the, the reason. Mm hmm. Yeah, but it's neat. And looking at this specific product, now it, now it dawns on me why USB-C may actually be a good thing, is that this thing will <laughs> do 5 volts, 9 volts, 15 volts, 20 volts right. at various power levels. It's like, oh, wow, I can have one charger for both my computer and my phone. And then the light bulb went on. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Oh, no, that's, that's definitely the, the why. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right. You just use the USB-C and, and yeah. Yep. That's it. So thanks for uh, helping me get on the USB-C bandwagon, guys. There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's fun. I, uh, you know, it's, um, I, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to this new USB-C world. I don't, other than my Apple TV, I don't think I have any devices that even have USB-C ports yet. Um, other than some chargers, of course. But mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah, it's fun. Yep. It's crazy. I have one. <laughs> well, you don't know. You don't have any. I mean, you have a charger, but you don't have yes. any devices that will take a charge with a USB-C port, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll, oh, yeah. I'm really curious to see what's in the next gen iPads, because that will tell us where Apple's going with this, right? Is it USB-C? Um, Are they doing away with lightning? Which would make sense. It's rumored that... Yeah. I mean, the pain in this case is that I had to buy Apple's uh, magic cable in order to do this charging here with lightning on one end. Yeah, right. it'd be nice to have standard connectors on both ends. <laughs> Correct. Like like the MacBook is now, right? And the MacBook Pro is. So, yeah. Yeah. I've seen the rumor mill talking about oh, absolutely. changing from lightning to USB-C. It kind of makes sense. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Of course, you wouldn't have you know, joined the special program and buy the special chip that, you know, does the MFI dance, right? Right. That is true. Oh, yeah. Huh. That's true. Well, but the iPhone does that dance on its own now, right? I mean, you're, and so does your Mac, right? It says, hey, like iTunes wants to talk to this device and your device says, hey, do you want to let this Mac talk to your, or this computer talk mm -hmm. to your iPhone? And so I don't think like you need that anymore. I, I think they've solved that in the software, which is a mm -hmm. good thing. So, yeah. All right. Well, that does it for us this week, folks. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, you can write into us at feedback at MacGeekGab.com. No, 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 no. It's feedback. At MacGeekGab.com. That is feedback at MacGeekGab.com, unless you are one of our premium subscribers, in which case uh, you, and, and I shouldn't say subscribers, premium members, because you don't have to have a subscription. You can, but you can also, as as you heard early in the episode, Leslie B. made a one-time contribution. That certainly makes you a premium member. And so, yes, please, you know, uh, use our premium at MacGeekGab.com address for any of you. 224-888-GEEK is the number any of you can call. And John, geek is? 4335. Three, three, and come visit us in the Mac Geek Up forums at macgeekup.com slash forums. I'm really considering just shutting down the Facebook group. Um, it's, uh, it's crazy to kind of have the community split into two places. The Facebook group is great, though. That's sort of the problem. That's why I've been hesitant. Let us know your thoughts on that, would you please? Let us know. Send an email. Leave a phone message. Let us know what you think about that because I'm, I'm really... And I'll post something to the Facebook group about this too. So, Yes, they got yes. Hacked, man. Well, it's not just that. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's too many places for it all to be. It's like we want we want a home and we have built one. So I, I think it's time to, to move into the new house. Move everybody into the new house and not have these two separate things. But maybe I'm missing something and maybe I'm not seeing the bigger picture here. So let us know. 
please, please let us know. Our thanks to Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. And then, of course, in the podcast marketplace, thanking all of our sponsors like uh, Otherworld Computing, as you heard earlier in the episode, Smile at Smile Software, or Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, Smile at SmileSoftware.com slash podcast, Barebones Software at Barebones.com, Ring at Ring.com slash MGG, and others, which you can visit, MacKeekup.com slash sponsors. And you will learn, yes, you will learn about all of them. And you can see the deals, even deals from non-current sponsors. MacGeekUp.com slash sponsors. John, what do you think? You got any final thoughts before we, uh, before we all go our separate ways for the week and reconvene next week? I, I think so. And that I learned one thing, Dave, at least. Yes, good. Hopefully, it well, no, more actually, I'm, I'm lying. It's two things. No, it's three things. And the three things that I learned are don't get caught. Made up.